Welcome to the Biomedical Systems Engineering Session of ESEC 2019. My name is Natalie Shafik and I am a first year engineering science student. I am honored today to introduce to you Dr. Arthur Slutsky. Dr. Slutsky is an expert emerging the field of medicine and engineering and is a true definition of an innovator. Last December, Dr. Slutsky was made a member of the Order of Canada for his lifetime of outstanding work in advancing preliminary medicine and improving critical care practices. Specifically, his research revolves around saving lives through mechanical ventilation, with many focuses such as bioprobar and organ dysfunction, among others. Dr. Slutsky has also received numerous awards, including the Canadian Institute of Health Research Award and the Distinguished Lecturer in Respiratory Sciences Award. Dr. Slutsky was the Vice President of Research at St. Michael's Hospital for over 18 years and is a critical member in the development of the hospital's Black Hat Student Knowledge Institute and the Canine Research Center. Additionally, Dr. Slutsky is a professor here at the University of Toronto and he teaches medicine, surgery, and biomedical engineering. After completing his Bachelor's of Applied Science and Engineering Science here at U of T, Dr. Slutsky went on to receive a Master's in Industrial Engineering and an MD. He has published over 500 peer-reviewed papers, editorials, and reviews, and is the most cited scientist in the world in the field of mechanical ventilation. Without further ado, please help me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Arthur Slutsky. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Natalie. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, I see one hand go up, so at least someone can hear me. So, so thank you, first of all, for the invitation. I haven't spoken to engineering students for a long, long time. And I haven't been an engineering student for a long, long time. And when I thought about why I was invited here, I think it was because people thought, the organizers thought, maybe I did uh, sort of a trajectory that was a little bit different than, than others. And I guess it is, but it's not unique. In fact, a colleague, Neil Shear, is here, who did the same trajectory, really did NSI, and we ended up being in medical school together at uh, McMaster. Neil is a, a world-renowned dermatologist, so if you have any skin problems, you can catch him at the end of this talk. <laughs> He'll be glad to help you out. You know, it was interesting uh, listening to Natalie's introduction. She started, ladies and gentlemen, and Neil and I were just talking beforehand how NSI has changed. When I did NSI, um, there was about 90 people in the first year class. There was one woman, so it would have been lady and gentlemen. Literally, it's fantastic to see so many women. I still understand it's a still minority. It's about 30% in NSI and about 40% in engineering, but that's way better. So, so we're, we're on the right trajectory for sure. And interesting, again, when we went to medical school, it was about 50%. No, I think it was 52% women and 48% men. So that's great to see. So what I'm going to do uh, over the next 40 minutes or so is talk about a personal journey. I was asked to talk about sort of how I got into medicine, how I got into engineering, and that's the, the clear part that, that deals with the NSI. This relates to ventilator-induced lung injury. It's a major uh, topic of, of my research, uh, and I think an important topic, as you'll hear, because of the implications for, for survival of patients in the intensive care unit, patients who are really, really sick. And this part, Vesalius, you're going to hear about Vesalius partway through my talk, because you know, I'm going to give a little bit of history of me but I'm going to give a history of, of mechanical ventilation as well. So here it is. This is a, a personal sojourn, if you, if you like. So it's not going to be technical. I know some of you like the technical stuff. I understand some of the, ta some of the talks that, uh, not today, but in the past have been too technical. So this is not going to be technical at all. I'm going to talk about the lung. I'm going to make you all pulmonary physiologists and respirologists after just an hour. <clears throat> talk about very, very little about gas exchange, respiratory failure, and how mechanical ventilation is used to treat respiratory failure. A fair bit about the history of mechanical ventilation, I think some interesting tidbits, a little bit on my research, and then, then end up with some lessons learned from, from being at this for a little longer than, than most of you, I would say. So career paths, you know, all of us wonder what career paths are we going to take? And you don't know if you're going to do something academic. This was, I like this cartoon, it said, Albert Einstein in his later years was unable to figure out why if he was so smart and so famous he wasn't rich. <laughs> so you know, you can do a little bit of both. You know, you can do the smart things, you can do the entrepreneurial things. Uh, when, I, when I went through NSI, there wasn't the same sort of degree of entrepreneurialship as there is uh, currently. 
So, what my early years, I was born in Toronto, but my parents were immigrants. They came after, after the war. Soon after the war, I was born here. Like, my mother was, uh, was pregnant with me on the ship. They came from a displaced persons camp in, in, you know, uh, in uh, Austria after the war. And, uh, and they came with nothing, basically. You know, they had no English. My mother actually had, had some university. My father had no university education. But one thing they were interested in or pushed all my life was sort of education. I'm sure that's true for, for, for many, if not all of you in the room, if you're doing NSI, that that was the case, that education was sort of critical, critical, and I think important. And my mother used to always say, what a great country Canada was. She says, people don't realize we're here. It really is an amazing country. And you come after the war, after the Second World War, so you can really understand that, that, that that's the case. So, um, in high school, I was really good at maths and sciences, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I don't know if that was the case for, I'm sure it's the case for many of you, you know? You're good in something and y you like it. So I, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. She said, you know, you have to be a doctor, of course. That was the case, my mother was a Jewish mother, what else could it be, want me to be a doctor? And I, you know, honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to be. So I remember coming down to New College um, in my last year of high school, and uh, I met somebody who was a couple years ahead of me in medical school, and I thought, oh, this is great, you know, we'll find out what medical school is about. So I chatted, was chatting with him about medical school, and he had a book called um, um, Atlas of Anatomy, Grant's Atlas of Anatomy. How, how many have heard of Grant's Atlas? It's sort of a classical text, some of you have. Neil has for sure. And in the book, there was a picture like this. It was a you know, stick person with all these lines and all these Latin names. And I looked at it and said, holy shit, there's no, I mean, that, I would hate this. I, I'm gonna hate this. I'm, I, have, you know, I was good in math, I could solve problems, but I couldn't, couldn't memorize things, especially when there's no framework. And I looked at that and said, absolutely no medicine. I'm not gonna do medicine. You know, I'm gonna do something that I enjoy. And so that's how I ended up in engineering. I looked at U of T and there was something called math, physics, chemistry at the time, MPC. I don't know if there's that course now, but NSI seemed like it would be a good way to sort of do the, the math and the engineering tied together. And so I went into to, to engineering science. And it was, uh, it was great training. As, as I'm sure any, all the speakers will talk to you about, um, it's not just the technical things you learn. We hear a great talk about the philosophy as well, not just the technical things, but it's a way of thinking. That, uh, I mean, I don't remember anything specific that I learned in NSYC, quite frankly, but I think that it really helped me, it really helped me, and I'll show you, so I, I took some equations that I was involved with, and holy crow, I couldn't understand any of it. But it really helps you in terms of how do you think, and that's, that's really what's important. I ended up actually uh, getting a job at the Toronto General Hospital in the bioengineering department, and that was actually very interesting. It was, uh, it was fun, I was given a fair bit of freedom, um, and after, you know, after doing, my, uh, actually before doing my master's in industrial engineering, and I actually I helped to sort of automate a process, and I ended up getting uh, a patent. I just pulled this out a few days ago. This is a patent, 1972, and I thought this was going to make me rich, right? You know, this is like this greatest thing since sliced bread. Actually, sliced bread is not so great. I don't know why people use that phrase. But anyway, all this did was cost me money, but it, it was sort of a, an interesting thing. So it was fun to do something creative and to do something that, that I think maybe he was helping patients a little bit. I ended up, uh, after my master's, getting a job in the systems department at, at the, one of the hospitals at, in Hamilton. And I worked there for a year. I enjoyed it, uh, but I realized, you know what, hmm, I saw doctors now working, and I thought, yeah, this might be interesting. And again, I met somebody who was a couple years ahead of me in medical school, and uh, he talked to me about McMaster Medical School. McMaster Medical School was relatively new at the time. He was in, like, I think the second or third class. It was small, it was, the key was, it was problem-based. Um, there was, so you, you start off and you get a problem of a patient with heart failure, and you have to, on day one, you have to figure out the anatomy and the physiology that's relevant. Um, and it sounded fantastic. There were no exams. Oh boy, this sounds really good. <laughs> I really like that. And so I applied, I only applied to McMaster. Luckily, I got in, and that set me on a course to, to medicine. And I, at part of medical school, I got involved with a, a number of individuals a guy named Tony Reebuck, who was uh, interested in respirology. And the, actually the math, I ended up, he, there was a paper published around that time, and it had a little bit of math in it, and he was completely lost. So he knew I didn't, had done engineering, so he asked me to sort of explain it to him. So I ended up, you know, here's the professor, and I was sort of the, the young kid in the block, and, and ended up explaining to him, and that got me interested in research, which was uh, really very exciting. 
One of the, the people who I met subsequently who was sort of key uh, in medicine, oh, this is what I thought was a good one. This is, this is why computer engineers should not be surgeons. <laughs> Let's shut down all these body functions and start them over again. <laughs> so uh, anyway, one of the people who uh, was critical, uh, was a real leader in Canada, was a guy named uh, John Evans. He was a cardiologist. He uh, was dean of the McMaster, first dean of the McMaster Medical School when he was 35 years old. Like he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. Ended up after that becoming the president of the University of Toronto. Then he went to the World Bank. He was the chair of many boards. Amazing guy. Chair of uh, Torstar, the Toronto Star. Amazing individual who just passed away, uh, as you see, a few years ago and did so much. Uh, and it's, you know, part of this talk is you know, how we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and John Evans clearly was a giant uh, uh, individual in many, many, many ways. So I went to McMaster Medical School. I then did an internship and residency at the University of Toronto, actually at the, the Mount Sinai Hospital and the Toronto, no, Toronto General Hospital at the time. Um, and I enjoyed it. Then I wondered, I, I got interested in pulmonary medicine because of this Tony Rebuck I mentioned uh, earlier. And then ended up going to the Brigham and Women's Hospital um, in Boston to do my pulmonary fellowship where I did research training and clinical training and ended up being on faculty at the Harvard Medical School for about, uh, about four years before returning back to Toronto. So I was in Boston for, for six years. And when I was in Boston, um, you know, I was thinking about what research to do. Uh, and I thought, the, as I said, this is the respiratory system was sort of a key to being a respirologist. And I thought I'd just very briefly tell you about the respiratory system because it's somewhat relevant for the rest of my talk. So this is, unfortunately, this is an anatomical piece with lots of lines and, and, uh, and arrows and names, but these are pretty straightforward. Essentially, the lungs, as you know, there's a couple, two lungs. You breathe in air to bring oxygen to the body. The oxygen gets into the lungs, traverses, is traversed by the bloodstream. Oxygen gets into the blood. And the lungs also receive carbon dioxide, which gets exhaled. The lungs are pretty amazing structures. You know, they branch uh, out, and the cross-sectional area in the alveoli, where the gas exchange takes place, is roughly the size of a tennis court. It's a really fantastic, interesting structure. So that, that's what the lung does, and that there's the circulation and close, close relationship between the heart, which you don't see, and the lungs. Now, in terms of classical pulmonary physiology, we can think of this, this is a multi-dimensional structure, but really think of it as this is the alveolar region, and this is called the alveolar region, the alveoli. There's a part of the lung which is the airways, the airways which is the trachea and the big airways, where there's no gas exchange because there's no blood, well, there's some blood, but there isn't very much gas exchange that takes place. To get adequate gas exchange, what you have to do is to get uh, oxygen into this alveolar region. The blood flows by this region and gets oxygenated, and that turns it into red blood. But the important thing here is that there's something called the tidal volume. That's the size of each breath. And as you can see from this schema, to get adequate gas exchange, you need a tidal volume that's bigger than this dead space. If you breathe, you know, this is, let's say, 150 cc's. If you breathe 100 cc's with each breath, you get no fresh gas down into the, into the lung part that, that's in opposition to the blood flow. So the traditional concept is that for adequate gas exchange, you need tidal volumes that are uh, greater than the dead space. And the rates, as we know, you breathe at roughly 8 to 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 breaths a minute, depending on your exercising. Infants and babies breathe at a higher rate, but it's roughly in, you know, 10 to 20 breaths a minute. So that's classical physiology. So why did I spend any time on this? And that's because of this guy, Charlie Bryan. Charlie Bryan passed away uh, a few years ago as well. He was a pulmonary physiologist uh, at, at the Hospital for Sick Children. Really smart uh, individual who was very innovative. And I was in Boston at the time, and, and we heard a rumor that Charlie Bryan was doing this technique of ventilation called high-frequency ventilation, which is at very high rates, like 10 to 15 hertz, you know, breaths per second, rather than per minute, and using tidal volumes that were less than the dead space. And you know, I, th I first heard about this as, they, they must be doing something wrong. Like, you know, we, th we all have classical, phys classical thinking, thought that he's doing something wrong, so we set out to prove that he was wrong and what he was talking about. And I worked with this guy, Jeff Drazen, 
I was one of his first fellows. Jeff Drazen is a really smart uh, respirologist, uh, pulmonologist as they call him, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's now the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, has done that for about 18 or 19 years, is going to step down soon. Fantastic mentor, again, a great individual. And what we did was uh, we, we talked about, we did some experiments, and then we needed some help. Because the concepts to, because what we showed was, in fact, Charlie Barn was right. You could get adequate gas exchange with these really small tidal volumes, but classical physiology of bulk flow in the lung didn't explain it. They couldn't get there from here. So we thought we, have to, we needed fluid mechanics sort of help. So we went across the river to MIT, and there was a guy named Asher Shapiro. That's, this is Asher Shapiro. He was uh, he's the, sort of the grandfather of fluid mechanics uh, at the time, and he, again, passed away about 10 years ago. Really brilliant individual. And, and because of my engineering background, I was able to sort of explain the problem and, and bring back some ideas that he and others, a guy named Roger Cam, who is a professor at MIT, uh, helped us with to help us with our understanding. I could never at that stage sort of reproduce or produce what they produced, but I could be a conduit. I could, you know, I could be sort of the, uh, understand enough of that to explain to the doctors and I could explain enough to the, to the engineers about the, fl the fluid mechanics piece. And that led to a very uh, interesting collaboration. This is a paper we published, well, the first paper on high frequency ventilation that we published. The, the schematic, the details here don't matter. We had a theoretical framework to sort of predict what gas exchange might be. And this was the animal data looking at uh, uh, actual experimental data, you know, and it fit pretty closely actually to the theoretical um, data that we had. And this was really exciting because here we are, we're sort of at the cutting edge, trying to explain a new approach to ventilation, this high frequency ventilation, which people thought was impossible before. Although, interestingly, there was a paper in 1915, there was a scientist who realized that dogs, when they pant, they pant with tidal volumes smaller than the dead space. And yet, obviously, they can, they can survive. And he had an interesting uh, mechanism that he thought was uh, working to explain the gas exchange. It wasn't right, but it was quite interesting, and I, I didn't bring a slide on, on that. So Roger Cam and Asher Sapiro were sort of very key individuals in this, and it was a great way of tying in engineering and medicine. We published a, a, a bunch of papers. I only took this one out. You'll see why. So this is with uh, uh, Roger Cam was a professor, Joshi was the student, Jeff Drazen and I were the, on the medical side. And I, I took this out because I looked at the paper last night, and there was these equations in there. And <laughs> in the question period, you're not allowed to ask me anything about those, these equations, okay? <laughs> I don't remember any of it. But I must I probably understood some of it back then. But the point is, as I said, it's a, it's a way of thinking and a way of being able to communicate with others in, in, uh, in the field. And then we published a number of papers. This is just a summary we published in the New England Journal. Um, an editorial on high frequency ventilation showing gas transport mechanisms in the upper airways, it's convection. It turns out even though the dead space, the tidal volume less the dead space on average for the lung, there are some lung units that are actually relatively close to the airway, to the uh, uh, airway opening, and so you can get direct alveolar ventilation. In this the, uh, alveolar region, because the cross-sectional area is so huge, it's basically diffusion that's operative in that region. And here there's a number of mechanisms where they, there's branching of airways. And by the way, I showed sort of a couple branching. There's 32, 32 layers of branching. So you, you got the, a huge number of, uh, of these alveolar regions. And this, these regions, this region here combines convection and diffusion. So that's high frequency ventilation. The high frequency ventilation, the idea was that it might be able to be used to improve outcomes in patients with what's called respiratory failure. So what's respiratory failure? Well, it's, it's a condition that, that happens when the lungs, or in fact, the muscles that control ventilation are not working very well, you get respiratory failure. And what happens then is you don't get enough oxygen into the blood, and or the CO2, carbon dioxide increases. Because you know the lungs, as I said, bring in oxygen, you exhale CO2. And the treatment, they obviously under, to treat the underlying disease, but the, the idea is to, to, to try and, how do you keep the patient alive while they're, you're trying to solve whatever the underlying problem is? And that's where mechanical ventilation comes in. That's a, a device, and um, this is just a, you know, sort of a cartoon what a ventilator looks like. You see a patient here, 
often usually has a tube down and then you connect, collect the, ventil you connect the ventilator to that tube and this, the ventilator basically essentially pushes gas in into the lungs and you exhale passively and that's what, this, that's what the ventilator does. It seems very, very simple. Yet it turns out there's a lot of interesting and important factors in ventilation that we've just begun to realize or just realized over the last decade or so. So that's what mechanical ventilation sort of looks like in a, in a modern ICU at the present time. But it wasn't always like that. And this now takes me back to, a, I'll give you a little bit of the history. And uh, it starts actually earlier, but I decided to start with Vesalius. Vesalius was a, a professor of anatomy. He was a full professor in Padua at the age of 23. Um, and he actually was born in, in Brussels. Um, and what he did was he did a, a number of things, but one of the things that sort of set him apart is in the prior to this time, anatomists would dissect animals. And what he did was he went against the church actually and dissected human cadavers. And what he found was that there were a lot of things that Galen, who was a famous um, uh, anatomist from about the year 100, and that, that message that Galen had taught was thought to be true for 1,500 years. And um, this fellow, Vesalius, Andreas Vesalius, showed him that, showed the world that that wasn't the case. And he did some interesting things. And in this, in this paper, in this book, he wrote a spectacular book called De Humanis Corporis Fabrica in 1555. It's almost 500 years ago. And this is the picture. And in this book, he talked about resuscitation. So you have to remember, this was at a time when people had no, scientists and physicians had no idea why we breathed. You know, people didn't know about oxygen. Oxygen and carbon dioxide wasn't discovered for, for a couple hundred years afterwards. And he did some great experiment here. What uh, Andres Vesalius did was, you can see here, there's a bench, there's a, a, there's a pig lying on this bench, and there's some people working around the neck. And here's, here's how he described it. He said, but the life may be restored to the animal. An opening must be attempted in the trunk of the trachea. So you put a, you put a hole in the trachea into which a tube of reed or cane should be put. You know, remember I showed you ventilators now? You put a, you don't necessarily, sometimes you put it into, directly into the trachea, often it goes through the mouth, but that's exactly what we do now. And you will then blow into this so that the lung may rise again and take air. So this was a fantastic description of what we consider now mechanical ventilation, sort of state of the art mechanical ventilation. This was 500 years ago. Unfortunately, back then, you know, um, knowledge didn't diffuse as quickly as it does as it does now. And what he taught really wasn't accepted again for, for a couple of centuries. And so I'll show you what, how people were uh, used approaches to resuscitation um, for the next two centuries. And they were, most of them were very different from what Vesalius did. So first of all, you have to, again, as I, uh, just to highlight, people wasn't clear why, why somebody had a drop to the floor, wasn't breathing, had no heartbeat. And it was thought, as I said, they didn't, it wasn't understood about oxygen and CO2. It was thought that these people weren't moving. So it was thought that the problem was there was a lack of stimulation. So if you stimulate the patient, that that will get them back to breathing. So it's actually, it's, it's a good model because if you, you develop a model and then when you develop a therapy, you base it on your hypothesis to what's causing the, the problem. So what did the people do? Well, if it's a lack of stimulation, well, let's roll them over barrels. <laughs> so they would take patient people, roll them over a barrel to try and stimulate them to breathe. They would throw them on their abdomens across a trotting horse. This, this was actually done. Can you imagine if this worked, what our hospitals would look like now? There'd be these long, <laughs> long hallways with horses. Flagellation. This is, gonna, this is gonna stimulate people, and that's gonna stimulate to breathe. I guess if you're alive, yes, you're gonna stimulate people to breathe. Inversion method, hanging them upside down. It's interesting, in, in intensive care now for a disease that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sometimes they put the patient prone, face down, that that actually improves gas exchange. It's not quite like this. The bellows method, so this one made sense, right? So this, this is actually very similar conceptually, physiologically to what we do now. There was the Russian method, covering them in ice. <laughs> <laughs> this could have been called the Canadian method, I guess. Uh, and one that I never understood, and, and this is real, if you Google this, the fumigator. And the idea was, blow smoke up the rectum of a patient, 
and somehow that would stimulate their breathing. And if you go online, you'll find this. Uh, this was actually, was actually used, again, I don't think it was terribly effective. <laughs> now, there, since then, and then uh, this is now a couple centuries later, this is now 1864, people understood a little bit better about ventilation and gas exchange. And this is one of the first body enclosing devices. You've heard of the iron lung, which I'm going to show you. Body enclosing devices. And they, the idea here is the patient sat in this device. There was a collar around the neck and it was airtight. And somebody would push on this that would increase the pressure in, this, in the chamber, cause gas to ex leave the patient. And when it went in the opposite direction, gas would go in and out. So this was uh, uh, patented in 1864. And this goes to show you, you don't need much data to get a patent. This is a US patent. It was issued. You can look it up. Alfred Jones said, this device cured paralysis, neuralgia, seminal weakness, asthma, bronchitis, and dyspepsia, and deafness. <laughs> and when judiciously applied, many other diseases may be cured. <laughs> eh, it doesn't work that way. So this didn't work out. But interesting, at least now it was physiologically made some sense. This was called the spirosphere. Uh, Alfred Wallet in Paris in the late 1800s, early 1900s invented this. This looks like an iron lung. I'm sure you've seen pictures of iron lung. As I said, I'm going to show you some more pictures later. The idea here, you put the patient in and you change the pressure again in this box. That causes gas to move in and out of the lungs. You can see there's an interesting device here that sits on the chest that tells you how much gas goes in and out. It tells you what the tidal volume is uh, of the patient, which is important. The trouble with this ventilator was it worked, but it was difficult to nurse the patient. How do you get into this patient? This, this is, the patient is totally enclosed in this. And for this to work, it's got to be airtight. So how do, you get, how do you get to the patient? So Peter Lord, who I'm, I'm sure was an engineer, used what I guess we call a brute force technique. He said, OK, let's get, build these, this room. This is a ventilation room. This is the patient lying down here, connected to the outside um, via this manifold. There's these big pistons that change the pressure in the room, which cause changes to gas flow in, in and out. And you can see there's a, there's a door here. You know, if you've ever been in an intensive care unit, you know, the doctors often do rounds around the, around the ventilator. Here you can actually go in and do rounds inside the ventilator. This is actually a, a body closing box. This was a, a ventilator. Now again, this was, I guess this was an engineer who did this. And then I guess the financial folks said, you know, this would be unbelievably expensive. Right? Like, you know, just look at one huge room to take care of a patient. Let's put <laughs> four <laughs> patients, <laughs> ventilate them. Um, and this, this actually was a ventilator built for kids by Wilson and Drinker. This was during the polio epidemic, and I'll come back to that in a second. You can see the, the, the door here. And this ventilator was actually used um, during the polio epidemic to, to treat kids at, at Boston Children's Hospital. And here's a picture uh, on the outside and what it looks like on the inside, taking care of these, uh, these patients. Things have certainly changed in the last uh, X number of years. And this is one of my favorite uh, <laughs> ventilators. Can you imagine somebody's got respiratory failure, and they can't <laughs> breathe, and they're standing there doing this to sort of vent <laughs> ventilate themselves? Uh, I, I'm not sure that was ever used, and the concept was that the negative pressure on the skin, and that's where, hey, Neil, you're a dermatologist, true, would draw gas products out and that would do the ventilation. That didn't actually work. Now, the modern era of mechanical ventilation, because these are old ventilators, but you know, physiologically they sort of make sense with what I, I showed you earlier. But the modern era of mechanical ventilation really came about with the polio epidemic. And this is a really interesting story. Um, in 1951, there was a polio epidemic around the world and a bunch of experts on polio came together uh, in, in Denmark and Copenhagen about 1,500 experts came together uh, and had a conference like you usually do. The problem was likely they brought polio virus with them, you know? <laughs> really, and, you know, obviously didn't mean to do that. And six months later, there's a terrible polio epidemic in Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, just to show you how terrible it is, this is the number of patients admitted to one hospital, and that was the, the respiratory hospital. This is on the x-axis, each one is a, is a week. Uh, this is a weekly admissions. And you can see at one point there was 300 admissions per week of patients with polio. And about half of them had paralytic polio. That means their polio was so bad they couldn't breathe on their own. And you know, many of them died. You know, in fact, the mortality rate was about 80%. It wasn't clear why they died. 
you know, right now it's so obvious to physicians why they would die, because they weren't breathing, but it wasn't clear at the time. It was thought maybe to do the renal failure, it was thought maybe that the virus got into the brain and that, that, that killed him in some way. And this guy, uh, Bjorn Ibsen, was an anesthesiologist who made um, the major discovery that this was probably due to respiratory failure. And again, and now if your hypothesis that's respiratory failure, you have to ventilate the patient. And in fact, that's what he did. And uh, this was a paper published uh, in The Lancet just a year later, you know, uh, and it showed the mortality rate from paralytic polio, as I said, was about 80%. They introduced mechanical ventilation at this point here, and mortality dropped essentially in half. You didn't have to do a randomized controlled trial to see that this was effective. Interesting, just as an aside, the author on this is a guy named Lassen. He was the head of the lab, or head of the, the department at the time. He fought against using this. He thought it was a crazy idea, and yet he published this, and he was the only author, which was, you know, <laughs> really uh, speaks volumes about some of the problems that can arise. Anyway, this led to things like this, you know, uh, to, with lots of patients being ventilated. It was realized that if you're ventilating patients in the, in the hospital, what they did was they started off ventilating patients on different wards. And they realized this doesn't make sense. You know, we've got patients on these difficult ventilators. And they're all over the hospital. Let's put them all together. So this was really the first, the first uh, ICU. And what happened was there were streams of, of physicians and medical students who provided manual ventilation. There, was, there wasn't uh, ve ventilators that were automatic. So you had to actually physically pump. So it was estimated that uh, at some point, 1,500 students provided over 165 hours of ventilation, manual ventilation. That was just to keep these patients alive. And as I said, this led to uh, intensive care units because all the patients, it was thought, it made a lot more sense to put all these patients together. And in fact, this is probably, this is in that Blenheim's Hospital, that's probably the first intensive care unit ever in the world was uh, in, this, uh, in this hospital. Now, it was realized soon enough that, you know, Mechanical ventilation can save lives. There was no question about that. But like any therapy we use in medicine, it's got side effects. And there was a fair number of side effects, and this is not a medical audience, so I, so I just, I'm not going to go into detail, but there was complications when you put the tube down. There's complications of sedation, and, and when you paralyze the patient, there are complications associated with that, one of which the diaphragm doesn't work so well. The diaphragm is a muscle that helps you breathe. The diaphragm doesn't work so well if you paralyze it and it becomes atrophied. There's oxygen. You used to use 100% oxygen all the time, and that turns out to be uh, a problem. There's problems with host offense. You know, when you, uh, when, you, when you get an infection in your lung, you cough, and that's good because you get, you're getting rid of whatever that infection was. If you've got a tube down, you can't cough because to cough, you have to close your glottis. You, you generate a high pressure, and then you release. Well, if you don't have a closing here, you, you can't really cough. And there's, the tube itself causes problems. Uh, this one is too uh, complicated for this, but one that would turn out to be, turns out to be very, very important is something called ventilator-induced lung injury, villi. That's been a major area of my research for the last 20, 25, 25 years. So what is it? I thought that I would uh, show you, let's see if I can get this to work. This is a video. I just want to give you a feel for what um, lungs look like when they're being ventilated. This actually is, um, this is not, these are not human lungs, these are rat lungs, but your human lungs would be very similar. Um, and I'll show it, I'll start it, and then potentially stop it. Uh, here we go. You can see the, the lungs being ventilated. You can see that there's areas of collapse in the lung. There's areas that are homogeneous. We're now going to increase the, the pressure at the end of ex exhalation in a second right there, and now you can see as the lung is in, it inflated more, these areas of collapse are being restored. That's called recruitment, recruitment maneuvers. And that happens here, and it finally happens here. So you have the lung being recruited. So this is what a lung looks like as, as you breathe. Um, and now we're gonna decrease what's called PEEP, the end expiratory pressure, back to zero. And you can see, it looks pretty homogeneous, but the next breath you're gonna see is gonna be non-homogeneous because the areas have collapsed. Now, it turns out that when you're ventilating like this, and, and this is similar to what's happening in your lungs now as we're ventilating. What's different is there's a chest wall, so that makes a difference, of course. But what's important here is that you can, these areas of collapse and reopening, that can cause injury to the lung. Just think of a, 
uh, surface uh, with that's a little bit sticky, you close it off like this and you pop it open. Just think of the middle of winter when it's really dry, you know, you kissed a metal thing on the outside at minus 20, you'd, you'd lose a lot of epithelium from your, from your lips. There can also, when the, if the lung is overinflated, that can cause injury as well. Um, that's pretty, pretty important. And think about it as a balloon just about, about to burst. So those are sort of, if you like, biophysical mechanisms by which you can get injury. And of course, it's much more complicated than that, but just gives you a feel for, for the area. This is a, a review article we wrote, and, and so there's injury that can occur at low lung volumes. We call that adlect trauma. Adlectasis is when the lung collapses, so we called it adlect trauma. Due to lung inhomogeneities, and there can be over distension, and you can have, you know, these are biophysical things. These can lead to a lot of problems in the lung. You can get sloughing of the lining of the lung, the epithelium. You can get something called hyaline membranes. You can get fluid in the lung, and of course, if you get fluid in the lung, not going to act very, you, know, you won't be able to have gas exchange very, very well. Normally you have a thin membrane here. If you've got all this fluid in the way, it, it, it has, makes problems with diffusion. So you can have lots of problems and something called barotrauma where the lung sort of pops open. So these are all classical things that can cause injury uh, with mechanical ventilation. What we discovered 20 years ago was something we've called biotrauma. And that's not by physical injury, that's the, the effect of the mechanical ventilation leading to release of biological mediators. So release of something called cytokines. These are just inflammatory mediators. That was, this was novel at the time because it was known when you apply a physical force, as I said, you're gonna get physical injury, but this is biological injury. And it turns out that the hypothesis we set out was that the injurious ventilatory strategies, if you stretch the lung too much, and if you allow it to collapse and reopen, you could get release of these mediators, and more importantly, and I'll come back to this, if these mediators get into the bloodstream, you saw that the blood traverses through the, through the lung, get into the bloodstream, they can then affect other organs like the kidney, the brain, the liver. So, and this is summarized here. So this is now you have biotrauma, you have release of mediators in the lung, you know, the specific names don't matter. You can get, you have physiological abnormalities that affect oxygen and carbon dioxide, but the important thing is if these mediators get into the circulation, they can lead to, via multiple mechanisms, to end organ dysfunction. And just show it a different way here, biophysical injury leading to organ dysfunction and biochemical injury leading to organ dysfunction and eventually, and eventually death. So what are some of the implications of this work? Well, there's a disease I mentioned to you called acute respiratory distress syndrome. And this is a disease, it's really a syndrome, not a disease per se, that can be caused by different things. Can be caused if you had pneumonia, sepsis, severe trauma. Can lead to a problem with increased inflammation in the lung. You get fluid in the lung. You get uh, white cells in the lung. And it's, it's, uh, it's very deadly, can be a very lead, uh, deadly disease. You have decreased oxygen levels because of the fluid, et cetera, in the lung. There's really no effective therapy for the underlying disease. What we're trying to do is keep the patients alive until their body heals themselves. And obviously there's a lot of research trying to sort out what are the underlying mechanisms so we can get pharmacotherapies, pharmacological therapies to help, but we, we don't have those as yet. And it affects about two to three million people worldwide, you know, so it's not huge, huge, but it's a pretty big problem. And the key thing is the mortality is, o is over 40%. This is huge mortality. Many of the people are relatively young. You have somebody who has a car accident at age 30, 25, could end up with ARDS. And the mortality in those patients is actually a little lower than 40, but still very high, 15%, 20%. And interestingly, most patients who die don't die because their uh, lungs aren't getting enough oxygen in. You know, you'd think that would be the major mechanism. They die because they develop multiple system organs. Other f organs fail. And, um, you know, this is a, a CT scan of a patient with ARDS. You can see a normal patient, I should have brought a normal lung, but it, it's sort of, this, the black part represents lung. This represents fluid in the lung and collapse of the lung. And you can see that in this case, you know, roughly 35% of the lung is, is fluid filled and not taking part in gas exchange. If you increase the pressure, you can sort of overcome some of that. Some patients, this might be 80%. So the, these are very tough lungs to, to, to ventilate and um, if the lung has a lot of this, you can see if you put in a, t uh, a tidal volume that's normal, it only goes to a little bit of the lung, 
that can cause overdistension and can cause more injury. So it turns out actually the injury that you produce by the ventilator, you, know, you, you help p keep people alive short term, but they end up dying long term because of the therapy you used. And how do we know that? Well, there's a fantastic article published uh, in 2000. This is a randomized controlled trial looking at ARDS and using a, a ventilation strategy that was normal at the time of 12 ml per kilos and comparing it to 6 ml per kilo. So what this means is just the, the size of each breath was reduced by half. That's, that was the therapy that was used. And mortality went from about 40% to 31%. 9% absolute death in mortality. That's huge. If you think about, you know, 3 million people in the world have this, if, if this technique is used, that could save 250,000 to 300,000 people's lives a year just by using a simple therapy. And what that told us was, and this was the sad part, if you like, because this is all, this is called what's called iatrogenic. This is caused by the, by the physician, him or herself, doing this because we're ventilating them too aggressively. We're ventilating them too aggressively. So this research led, with, with research from many, many other people, led to a change in how patients are ventilated in the ICU. ARDS patients, most importantly, but also other patients. Turns out that this ventilator induced lung injury is important not just in patients who have horrible lungs, but in patients who have, you know, uh, more normal lungs. So that's sort of the, the summary of our research. I, the last couple slides are just talk about what I've done since. So in 2000, I came back to Toronto in 84, worked at the Mount Sinai Hospital, and then in 2000 went to, to St. Michael's Hospital to be the first vice president of research there. I also led the Division of Critical Care Medicine. And this was, this was great being the vice president. The hospital is a fantastic hospital and there was a, a lot of growth in research over the time. We, we built, um, moved in about six, seven years ago, the Kenan Research Center and the Li Kaixing Knowledge Institute. This is the research building at St. Michael's Hospital. We, we had nothing like this before. Um, you can see there's a bridge to the hospital and this bridge is important. It's sort of a metaphor for what we want to do and that's we want to bring the clinical activities and the research activities close together to have, uh, to have uh, an important impact uh, on patients. And this is sort of the bridge from, from the inside. And I think it's transformed St. Michael's Hospital uh, tremendously over the past number of years. And I'm not going to spend uh, much more time on that. I thought I might finish up with the last couple slides on sort of lessons learned, just, just some top of mind lessons learned. The first one I would say is uh, do what you love. Like, you know, you're not sure what you want to do. I would say do what you love. That, you know, first of all, you're going you're to really enjoy it. And you're going to be much better at what you do. I mean, you're going to be more likely to be successful if you're doing what you love. So I, I would say don't go into an area just because it's sort of a, necessarily a hot area or whatever. Do something that you really love. And that's, that's, uh, that's what I sort of tell all the residents, all the trainees. I think that that's uh, uh, useful advice. That's, you know, have fun. If it's not fun, do something else. You know, uh, find something else. It's, you know, it's easier said than done at times. But, but, you know, it's really important to, as I said, enjoy things. Um, develop collaborations. I, you know, much of the work, you know, someone mentioned the introduction, Natalie mentioned I had over 500 papers. I only get that, that many because of the collaborations, the collaborating with people from, from around here, around the world, and it's, it's been fantastic because you develop friendships, develop collaborations. You do have to be careful. I think that it's a really important, I, I like to help others, and actually Neil and I were talking about this, like, and see p other people's growth. That was especially true when I was vice president, like, you recruit people and you try to give them resources and just push them in, 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 in a positive way and, and it really is incredibly rewarding. But you have to be careful with your collaborations. You know, this is the brief collaboration between Alfred Nobel and Thomas Edison. Might have led to a bit of an explosion. Remember what the, uh, Alfred Nobel discovered? Um, engineering is, is great training. You know, um, for whatever you want to do, you're lucky. I mean, you have, you're going to have foundational training that is phenomenal, whether you stay in engineering, whether you do medicine, whether you do philosophy, whether you do whatever you do, uh, that training is gonna be fantastic because it trains you to think. And I think that that's, that's transferable to anything you do, whether it's business, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And I think getting interested in different kinds of research, you know, sort of um, are a little unusual, often make it more interesting because you're bringing a different perspective and someone else is bringing a different perspective to a problem. Um, Ac academics is, is a great career, you know, uh, I've been lucky, Neil's been lucky, it's really just phenomenal, both in terms of the intellectual stimulation, 
if you think about academic medicine, the impact on patients, and the collegiality. We have friends sort of around the world, basically, because of the research, uh, and it's just been incredible. Um, there is, you know, potential issues, like surely you were aware when you accepted the position, professor, that it was publish or perish. So I guess, you know, to continue on, you have to publish, but it's, uh, but it's, it's fun to do the publishing and working with people. Um, you know, it's wonderful to do something interesting that, that impacts the health of many. You know, I think that that's, that's uh, been incredibly satisfying. You know, uh, I haven't taken care of patients now for a few years. When I did, it was really satisfying taking care of a patient. You see a patient in the intensive care unit who maybe survived because you helped them. But to do research that Im impacts potentially hundreds of thousands of other patients, I mean, you don't know who those patients are, but it's, it's really a, a, wonderful, a wonderful feeling, and you know that there's been, there's been an impact. Um, this is a mantra I wanted to, uh, on the leadership part when I was vice president, which I think is very important because it's really transferable not just to leadership, and that is when I was recruiting people, I thought it was important, you obviously want to recruit really smart people, like there's no question that's important, but actual people we, we actually ended up hiring, personality was important. So, you know, you're going to work with these, you're going to work with people you hire or work with, you know, eight hours, ten hours a day, you, you probably spend more awake time than with your spouse. So it's really important to me and to build a culture to have people that, that are fun, that are, that are collaborative, that, that want to work together. That, to me, is, is critical, probably the most important thing in terms of, uh, of leadership. And my last slide, you know, it's been a blast. You know, I've had a, uh, enjoyed my career, and, and it still is. I'm still doing research as I step down as vice president, but I'm still doing research. And uh, I hope that many of you take sort of a, a similar approach or any, uh, learn something from this and take a, maybe a different approach, but, but learn something from this. And I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you have. There's a, there's a question at the back. You're going to have to speak very loudly. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Uh, you are a very renowned scholar, and you got cited quite a lot. So I would like to ask, as a researcher, how do you do something significant? So Richard Hammond, once, he was a computer scientist at Bell Labs. He once had a talk called You and Your Research, and he talked about like how researchers do something think about what will be the next So the question, I'm just repeating it because this is being taped and uh, you don't have a microphone there. So the question was, how do you know or how do you end up doing, uh, I guess I would say impactful research. Is that right? Yes. Impactful research. So, so the truth is, when you start, you don't know. You know? Uh, it's very difficult to know ahead of time. It's, it's important to think about the importance of problems. So if, you, if, you're, if you're dealing with an important problem, then if you come up with a solution, you know that's going to be impactful. But when you start on that, working on that, important problem, there aren't obvious solutions quite often. So you may go down tracks, and in fact, I did many times, go down tracks which don't have, don't provide anything that's going to have an impactful solution. So to be quite honest, work on interesting, important problems, work with good people, and the most important thing is be lucky. Like really, I know this, that sounds corny, but you know, you, 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 you can do everything that you think is right, but to have, to have, uh, to discover something that then has an impact you need a bit of luck because there's a lot of great ideas that when they're tested out, they don't work out. When you do the randomized control trial I mentioned, they just don't work out. The, the, the brilliance behind them is as good as the brilliance of any other idea that, that, that is successful. So you have, to have, you have to have a bit of luck. And I think the key there is, as I said, do stuff that, that's fun, that's interesting, that you love. Because first of all, if it's a you know, bit of a blind alley, you'll still have enjoyed yourself. And you're, you're likely to be more innovative and creative and uh, get that, that, tw that tweak that's a little different uh, and then have an impact. Like 
No, I, so the question was, you know, it's, it's not just luck, because many people who discover things discover multiple things. And that's, that's true, that's not always the case. There's many people who discovered sort of a single thing. But, and there, is there, so the question was, is there, do I have any roadmap? And it's not, it's a matter of, you know, um, uh, I, I guess, you know, I, I talked about, for example, picking, um, picking collaborators that are, that are fun to work with, that you enjoy. And you know, the more collaborative you are, and the more of these collaborators you have, you, you know, you, if you work with 10 spectacular people, 20 spectacular people, you're more likely together to, to discover something. So part of it is that. Part of it is, is luck, but you know, he can't, when I say luck, of course, I don't just mean you sit around and flip a coin and hope things work out. I mean, you know, you, you have to, tra you know, you're trace tech attacking things, you're going along a certain area, you realize it's not gonna work out, you sort of have to know when to switch, and, there's no formula for, for that. It's got, it's because it depends on the unique situations that you're dealing with. But I think, um, you know, as I said, you can, be, you can be as smart as the next person or smarter, but the luck in terms of that final step off and of doing the, the trial to prove that it's effective, there's, there's n you know, if you look at the, the pharmaceutical industry, sort of, uh, you know, there's, for every drug that's tested, for every 10 drugs tested, maybe one or two is successful. The, the brilliance and the thinking be, that went beforehand is, is the same. It's just a matter of, it's su such a complex system that you have to be a, a little bit lucky. And I, I don't wanna, I don't, as I said, I don't wanna stress that too much, but you know, you can be equally smart, but that luck does make a, does make a difference. Yes? Yeah, so the question was, or the comment started with, um, and I don't know the right number, but it, let's say half or more Nobel Prizes were awarded to discoveries that were sort of based, if you like, on luck or uh, unexpected things that were d discovered. And how do you then, how do you actually get there from here? Is that, is that a fair summary? So, so I would say, so let me expand on the luck bit. I think, you know, if you think about penicillin as a good example, yeah, it's, it, was, it was a discovery. The key is, to keep your mind open. So when you see something unusual, not to say, oh, that doesn't fit with my hypothesis and dump it. You just say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. Is there something real? Is there? So I think you have, to, you have to, so it's not just a matter of luck, but then the person has to be, has to be astute enough, open-minded enough, maybe the right word, to be able to then follow up on that observation to sort of take it, take it further. Probably many people have seen that same observation and just thought it's 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 uh, you know it's a fluke it's a it's an artifact didn't follow up on it and I guess partly related to that is certainly I know when I I when I collaborate or talk to people I listen to everybody because everybody has great great ideas don't think that only it's a couple of people who have great ideas so you know if if in the hospital if the janitor comes up to me and says he's got a great idea about doing something. I'm gonna to listen to that because that's, you know, as I said, things come from, from, from different directions. So I think being open, not just being closed-minded that this is the right way, because this is the right way will get you only so far, but it's not gonna get you sort of the huge discovery, you know, sort of the linear thinking. It's gotta be a little bit to the side. So that, that's a sort of, a, 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 I guess, an extension of the, of the, the luck, you, ha, you, know, um, you know, luck and, and being prepared for that is I think uh, equally important.
Thank you. I think there's a second part about how you deal with like the setbacks, like emotionally and professionally. Yeah, okay. If you're going to yeah. fail a whole bunch of times right. on the search. For so the, 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 the second part was um, how do you deal with setbacks and failures? Um, because there's going to be lots of failures, and there are. And I think, um, you know, it's about, about, I guess part of it is managing expectations. Like a lot of life is managing expectations. So if you, if you realize that, so if you see somebody who's been successful and done something, knowing that that might be the hundredth thing that they've done, that, you know, there's been 99 things that they tried that haven't worked, I, I think is, is, is important. So managing expectations. I think you have to have, um, not really, I wouldn't say a strong ego, but understand that, that you know, um, just because you failed a couple times doesn't mean you're a failure. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a big difference. And sort of having some confidence uh, in, in what you're doing. Having friends and collaborators who can commiserate with you and, and talk about it. And so I think those are, all, those are all factors. But the important thing is realizing that, uh, you know, things aren't, aren't linear. It's not like, you know, I've got to solve this problem and boom, you know, a year or two and boom, it's done. And it's, it, there's all sorts of tangents and, and blind paths. And it's, it's, not, it's often, it's usually not easy. And I'm sure many of you will, if you've done a PhD, I didn't do a PhD, but you know, even for, for, I've directed a number of PhD students, you know, if you look at it, they spend, let's say, four or five years, quite often it's, it's all the work in their thesis is in the past six, in the last six months. They had many blind alleys on the way up. So I think that, that that's important, that that's just the way it is. It's not gonna be, everything is not gonna be easy uh, for you, for sure, for sure. And I guess, you know, Getting back to where I started with, um, with my mother and parents coming across, you know, like it was tough for them, right? And so when I think, well, it's tough for me, pff, compared to how tough it was for them, is, it's a piece of cake. And I'm sure that's true for, for many of you, you know, that, that we're lucky to be here, lucky to be at a great university in a great country. Um, we're just pretty lucky. So, so yeah, things aren't gonna work out all the time, but that's fine. And in many ways, you know, if you do things and everything works out really easily, you're probably not doing important enough or difficult enough problems. You know, you're, ta you're taking the easy stuff. You, got, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to fail. It's, in fact, it's very common to fail multiple times. But as I said, that doesn't mean you're a failure. Does that get at that? So, so the question is, how, how do you know when, when to stop in a way, when to say, uh, continue on? And I, I can't, there's, no, there's no answer. And by, by that I mean, you have, I, I'm actually working on a project with a colleague. We've developed a powdered nicotine inhaler to help people get off cigarettes. Because what kills people from smoking, the nicotine is, is the addictive part but it's the other 5,000 components of cigarette smoke that kill people. So if you could have clean nicotine, you could actually, even if people say addicted, nic nicotine is not very dangerous by itself. Um, so we've been working on that for over 20 years. And it's just, you know, maybe we should have stopped earlier. Maybe we should have stopped earlier. You don't, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say, um, it's hard to say when to stop. And each case is different. And there's often no, there's no, there is a right answer but I don't think there's any way to know the right answer at the time. You know, so some people might be considered stubborn because they st stayed working on something for 10 or 15 years and then they had this major discovery. Um, others would say, they're, yeah, they're, you know, if, the, uh, if, if you did that same 10 or 15 years and didn't come up with discovery, say you were stupid to continue doing that. So uh, there's, no, there's no answer. It's, it's sort of a bit in your gut, a bit of, again, getting advice. But even, you know, getting advice, some, some people tell you to stop, but you're committed. Uh, you know, there's, you know, you know, these are really good questions, but I would say for sure there's no answer. There's no formula for sure. Maybe we can use artificial intelligence to help us, you know, get, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, get, uh, you know, five million discoveries and, you know, 100 million non-discoveries and just, but we're not, gonna, we're not gonna get there from here. It's just, it's, uh, it's a feeling, it's a commitment. And um, if, if, you're, if, you, if you spend 10 or 15 years and you turn out to be right, you turn out to be the genius, and if it's in the same 10 or 15 years and it didn't happen to work out, 
you were stupid for doing it. So, uh, you know, uh, there's, no, there's no definitive answer. Yes? So I, I personally haven't incorporated, although I'm, the, the person at St. Mike's who runs that is a guy named Mohammed Ramdani, who's a spectacular guy. So, so any of you who are interested in machine learning and doing it with um, real data sets and having impact, email me and I can put you in touch. I, you know, I don't think he has the capacity to take on that, but, but it, it, oh, so the question was how, how much have I taken on um, sort of machine learning in my research? I haven't yet, but I've actually been talking to Mohammed. We're going to get together because there's areas that he's working on, you know, in terms of in intensive care, in terms of predictive analytics for patients, who, which patients are going to crash, meaning are they going to do poorly so he could intervene. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that has huge potential. I mean, you know, we, we know that there's, 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 there's problems and we don't know if the potential is actually going to be fulfilled. But he's doing some work now, for example, where he's taking patients who are in the ward, you know, not in the intensive care unit, and using various um, algorithms trying to decide which patients are likely to either die within 24 hours or have to be admitted to the ICU within 24 hours. And if you could do that 24 hours in advance, you could then intervene and then uh, potentially have a huge impact. And he's a they're able to, with their, with their algorithms, uh, for every two people they say at high risk, one person actually crashes or dies. That's a pretty good, that's, that's, um, that's a number which you can now intervene. You know, if, you, if the machine learning predicted 50 is 50 people, and only one ended up in the ICU, it won't help. But now the, the key thing is, he can do that prediction, but can we now intervene and make a difference? Maybe that we can predict, but we can't make any difference. So then there will be interesting intellectual uh, exercise, but not necessarily useful and impactful. But that's, that's the kind of thing he's doing. He's doing things that are really, his, his mantra is, he wants to do things that are impactful. So, Anything he does is not just, it's all, it's all based on, I would say, um, very rigorous science, but it's got to have, it's got to be implemented at the hospital. If it can't be implemented, he's not going to work on it. So like I said, email me if you're interested in some of that stuff. He's, he's got a fantastic, it's not a big team. We got, um, you know, the, the institute I mentioned was the Li Ka-shing Knowledge Institute. It was funded by uh, Li Ka-shing, he was the richest man in Asia, you know, sort of worth about $35 billion or $50 billion, and he donated any money, and he also gave us $10 million to artificial intelligence a few years ago, and that's what led to this, to this group being started. So thank you. Yes? Well, so the question was, there's all, there's all these technologies, whether it be genetic engineering, robotics, and medicine, and uh, what's going to hit the home run? Is that what your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, again, it, it's a guess. I mean, I do think, I do think that the, the big data and artificial intelligence, I mean, it's the, sort of the hottest area now. Whether it will pan out, I actually think it will pan out, certainly in some areas. I mean, it's not going to be a panacea for everything. I do think in terms of robotics, you know, for surgery, um, robotics is being used, is being used now. Um, artificial organs, at some point, we're going to be able to produce them. I mean, it's been a, that's been a dream for, for decades, but it looks like we're maybe getting closer, although, you know, I was around in 1989, the gene for cystic fibrosis was discovered. And I thought at the time, boy, in 10 years, we're going to have a therapy, we're going to cure cystic fibrosis. And now it's like you know, it's 30 years later or something, and th there are for a few mut mutations, there is sort of targeted therapy. It takes, a, it takes much longer than you think, and it takes longer um, because to actually, well, to understand the science, but actually then to be able to do it in humans and test it and do the right trials and, and, 
humans are complex biologic structures. There's often unexpected, unexpected uh, things happening. So I can't tell you. I think there's going to be. I think there's going to be um, advances in, in each one of those fields, quite frankly, because they're all moving along in a in a, uh, a very exciting way. But when it'll be, whether it's five years or ten years or maybe fifty years, I don't know. But all those areas are definitely going to have an impact. Yes. So uh, I know that you have said that you haven't worked in adult intelligence directly. In which, sorry? In artificial intelligence right. directly. But there has been some recent work in um, continuing machine learning where uh, they are being used to predict and diagnose patients. And I was wondering, as someone who has, has experience in clinical patients, uh, what is your opinion on machines that do this diagnosis? Yeah. So I think it's, I, I do, uh, you know, there's, there's some debate about that. I guess some doctors are hesitant. I think it's fantastic. Like, there's only how much can one brain, you know, contain? And so I, I don't think it's going to replace physicians so quickly, but I think in terms of diagnosis, especially for unusual things, um, that it's going to be uh, at some point, and maybe it's there now, at some point it's going to be very, very useful. They're just, as I said, so, so much data coming in, and how many, how many p pieces of data you know, can you sort of control in your brain at the same time? So I think it's going to have, I think it's going to have a big impact. Um, you know, th in, in parts of radiology, which is a lot of signal detection, if you like, you know, looking at an image, it's already having an impact. In terms of pathology, it's having an impact. And I think that there's no question um, that in terms of diagnosis, uh, it's, it's going to be, actually that's going to be on the relatively soon side, not necessarily for every disease, but but I think for, for, for a number of diseases, artificial intelligence is going to have, uh, is going to have uh, an impact. I'd be interested to hear what, what you have to say. Hmm. <laughs> uh, we have an expert in artificial intelligence here. Not a physician, but... I mean, I, so I don't, I don't work so much in the, in the biomedical space. I mean, okay. Well, I, I don't work so much in the, in the biomedical space, but yeah, I think to your point about radiology, I think it does seem like computer vision is one of the areas where it's like pretty clear that there will be applications. But I think already we're noticing all kinds of problems where it instead picks up spurious correlations in the data. Like maybe all of your scans where the person had cancer were from one particular hospital and it just figures out how to detect which machine did the scan. So there's going to be all kinds of weird little problems like that which will make it not happen in the next few months but maybe in the next few years as we have to sort all of these things out. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. I mean, all these things have to be, to be really useful, they have to be generalizable. And that's where large scale randomized control trials, multi-center, done in multiple units, hospitals, universities around the world is what's really sort of the gold standard and, th and that, that, that has to be done. And you have to then test the impact, not just sort of some great algorithm. So the question was, um, there's a lot of hype about artificial intelligence. What, what are some of the problems in healthcare that uh, are being overlooked? And, and I think probably one thing is, um, is, is equity in healthcare. If you look at sort of the poor, you look at disadvantaged, you look at uh, communities, whether it be the homeless communities, you know, they're not getting the kind of healthcare that, that people in this room are getting. So disadvantaged populations uh, Aboriginal populations are not getting appropriate health care, even though we have, we have the answers, but how do we actually deliver them? So I would say if you could probably have the biggest bang for the buck in the short term, not from new discoveries, but from just applying what we know now more broadly, and I don't just mean now disadvantaged populations, but also helping with disadvantaged populations. You know, one reason I I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoy being at St. Michael's Hospital, it's a downtown teaching hospital, focuses on disadvantaged populations. We have, a, we have one of the research areas that's in the Li Kaixing Knowledge Institute is in, um, in homelessness, disadvantaged populations. And that's a research focus. That's a major area. And it's, uh, it's a difficult area, but I think it's, uh, that's one of the, the key areas. And then how do, you, how do you get physicians, nurses, all healthcare practitioners actually applying what is already known? So we have the answer but it's just not applied because, you know, 
when people graduate from medical school or nursing school or whatever, you, you often, you know, when you start, you're, you're caught up, but 10 years later, you're still remembering or doing things that were done 10 years ago, and some 20 years later, you're doing things that were done 20 years ago. That, so that it's called knowledge translation, how you actually get people to do today what is known. And uh, so those are sort of, and then, uh, you know, then you talk about all sorts of things about cancer and uh, all those other heart disease, et cetera, but there's a lot known that isn't being applied. Yes? Um, so you talked about VLI and how it was an unintended consequence of encounter ventilation. So my, quest my question is, um, as medical advances are changing in technology, especially like artificial intelligence, um, how do we mitigate the long-term consequences of developing these medical technologies? So the question is, um, you know, VLI, uh, it's, it's iatrogenics caused by physicians in a way. And so with artificial intelligence and what's going on in the future, how do you mitigate what we're doing now to prevent problems in the future? That's a very good question. Um, part of it is, I guess, keeping our eyes open and, and being, as I said, thinking very deeply about what we do. Uh, because, you know, I was around back then when we, we were using ventilation strategies that were uh, harmful. And the problem is, um, so I didn't have time to talk about this, but the problem was our, our, um, our schema changed. So back then, our focus was we thought we have to get the gases, the bl blood gases normal, means the oxygen level in the blood, the carbon dioxide level in the blood, we have to get it normal. And that made a lot of sense, right? So, kept, so PCO2 was 40, PO2, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, over 100. We, that, was a, that was the goal. Turns out, um, we realized with more and more experiments that to do that, you actually cause more injury. So there, there wasn't the knowledge, we, like there, no one could have foreseen that that would be the case until more research came on. So I guess one thing I would say is we should be doing a lot of research and basic research to understand the mechanisms. Secondly, we have to then test things because some things make a lot of sense um, physiologically, biologically, but when you actually try them in a clinical trial and you randomize patients and you get rid of the biases that occur, that, that, that your invention or your approach doesn't really help at all and you have to test it rigorously. But I'm, I'm not sure there's gonna be a way, because you have to know the answer to realize what you're doing is wrong in a sense, right? So again, keeping an open mind, but then testing the, the science and, and the, the, uh, the experiments to, to, and then the randomized controlled trials would be sort of a, a couple of approaches. I think we might have time for one more question. Yes. Perhaps in 2007 you talked a lot about creating impact. And, uh, and I was curious, how does your background as an engineer comes into play? Because you, you said that engineering was a great training, but do you see engineering just as a tool for you to, I mean, become a doctor and then create impact? Or do you think of engineering as a domain that is impactful as in? Yeah, so the question was, uh, did, did my engineering background, well, did it have a direct impact because it was engineering, if you like, or was it just sort of training me to think logically? And I would say for me, it was probably a little bit of both because I think that initial work with high frequency ventilation, collaborating with the group at MIT was clearly because I had that engineering, some technical skills. And as those technical skills, you know, disappeared and the, the programming disappeared and all that, I would say that it still helped in terms of the thinking, but it wasn't, it wasn't technical knowledge for sure that was important. And, and that's okay, that's true for any of us. You go in a different direction, you're, you're gonna change, and if you continue doing something, then you're gonna continue, you're gonna improve your technical, those technical skills. So I would say for me it was both, and that's gonna vary tremendously for each individual, depending on what they end up actually doing. For me it was a little bit of both. At the beginning, engineering was, played a big, big role, and I would say the last few years it was more Biolog biology, physiology, clinical trials, but even the clinical trials, when I think about uh, there's a lot of data analysis, a lot of th that, um, you know, not being afraid of equations, you know, be surprised in medicine how many people, like you look at the simplest equation and they're, you know, sort of, you know, they, it blows them away. They get, they, you know, you know, uh, one thing I hadn't mentioned was interesting, when I started uh, medicine, you know, engineering, you know, I could, there could be integral calculus or differential calculus, I could spend, 
you know, two, three hours on, on one or two pages, and it was finally got it, and I would never forget it. Well, I've forgotten it now, but you know, <laughs> be. My, in medicine, I could read a chapter, close a chapter, and read, read, I didn't remember anything, you know, because it's, there isn't the same sort of framework. So I think, but in terms of the, for me, engineering played a big role, technically at the beginning, and less so now, but has, a, has a had an impact. 